Amen. I believe all of us could say a great big amen to how great Thou art. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful song. And the choir did that song, It's Still the Blood. And I'm glad it's still the blood. And it's through His... You know, without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That word remission means forgiveness. And I'm glad that He came, He shed His blood. In Peter it tells us, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood. With His precious blood. Thank God for that today. I want to ask you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter number 4. The book of Acts, chapter number 4. You know, I have really uh, had a tremendous burden for our country for quite some time. And I know that you have too. I know that you've prayed for our nation. And you've been praying for our nation. We request prayer uh, for our nation. And uh, we look at and we see the events and things that are going on uh, around us. It just breaks our heart. I mean, you just, for a child of God, to see a lot of the things that are taking place uh, in our country today, you know, it just really uh, breaks our heart to see those things. And I've really been burdened uh, for our country and been trying to pray uh, for our country. A couple of weeks ago, uh, most of you remember some of the rulings that the Supreme Court uh, came out with. And I was so enraged, I guess is about the best way, uh, that decisions like that would be made contrary to the Word of God and contrary to what God's Word says, that decisions in this country uh, would be made uh, in, that, in that light. And I, I was, I could have bit a 16 penny nail in two, I guess, uh, when I heard, heard that. But you know, I'm glad that God gave me a wife that reminded me of something. And she said this. She said, regardless, God's still in control. Regardless, God is still in control. And God has burdened my heart. I, I still have a burden for our country. And I believe there's hope for our country. I believe our country can turn back to God. I really and truly do. But God has really burdened my heart concerning the church. And, and the professing, I mean the professing church and the true church uh, here across this land. And I want to share something with you that God's laid on our heart. And I want you to pray for the next uh, few minutes. And, uh, service to mo uh, this morning, tonight, and uh, probably next Sunday morning as well uh, will be geared uh, more to uh, the church. And God has really burdened my heart concerning this. And I, I want you to pray uh, for the next few minutes. And I, I know that you've been praying. I felt your prayers this week. And uh, we've, been, uh, we've been out of town for the past week. And, and uh, you know, just to uh, try to get everything, I guess, together. Uh, we get, you get caught up sometimes. You need a time to catch your breath. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, your prayers. I appreciate you praying for us. And I appreciate the comments that several of you made this morning uh, as we came back. Uh, this way, but the book of Acts, chapter number four, and I'll ask you if you will, if you're able to do so, to stand for the reading of God's Word. And in chapter four of the book of Acts, I'd like to read verses eight through twelve. And listen to these verses. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him 
Does, does this man stand here before you whole? This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The thought that God's laid on our heart this morning is this. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe this? The Scripture that I read this morning, do we really? I'm asking this, do we really and truly believe this Scripture? Look at verse number 12 one more time. It says, neither is there salvation. Listen to this. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Do we really believe that verse in the Scripture? God, our Father in heaven, we bow before You thanking You for the day. Thank You for the blessings. Thank You for Your Word. Speak to our hearts now, I pray. God, I pray that we'll be a changed people when we leave this building today. God, finger about our hearts. If there's anything within us that's not pleasing to You, God, I pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. God, it will come and we'll repent of that. And God, allow You to cleanse us. Lord, help us to be a vessel that will bring honor and glory to Your name and to Your name alone. We love You, Lord. We thank You for loving us. Pray if there be a person in this building that's not saved. God, I pray for the drawing power of the Holy Spirit to draw them to You, that they'll be saved by Your marvelous grace. Thank You, God, for all that You have done in days past. Thank You for the work that You're doing right now in the hearts of people that are gathered here and people that are listening by the way of radio. And God, I want to thank You already for what You're going to do, uh, Lord, uh, through this service today. And we'll be careful to give You the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And for His sake we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that in the last days, perilous times shall come. In 2 Peter chapter number 3, told us that in the last days they would be scoffers walking after their own lust. Uh, Jesus said, uh, said this also. He said that, you know, in the last days that the love of many would wax cold. And I want to tell you what, we are in those last days. And as we are in the very last days uh, of time, and you say, preacher, just what, what, when's this thing going to draw to a close? Uh, when's this thing going to draw uh, to an end? Uh, Jesus said, no man knows the day and the hour. He said, not even the Son knows. He said, but the Father uh, in heaven knows. And I don't know exactly, I'm not a date setter, but I do know this, the time is drawing near uh, that this thing's coming to a close. And uh, it's, a, it's very, uh, very near. And we know that through Scripture and the things that we see in Scripture, that we are living in the last days. Now you and I that are sitting in this building uh, this morning, most of us in this building uh, probably could raise their hand in a testimony that they've been saved uh, by the grace of God. Well, what are we doing in these last days? What kind of difference are we making uh, in these last days? What kind of influence are we having upon other people's lives in these last days? Uh, talking about family, talking about uh, friends, talking about neighbors. Uh, what kind of impact are we having for eternity's sake uh, in these last days? Now, as we look in this Scripture, I just want to kind of bring you up uh, to this point of Scripture in chapter number 4 and give you just a few things. You may want to jot uh, some of this down. Uh, as we bring you up uh, to this, back in the Gospel of John, chapter number 13. And if you are very familiar uh, with the Gospel of John, you know that this is uh, the chapter that Jesus, uh, before the peace, uh, feast of the Passover, that Jesus uh, took His disciples, and after supper, He washed the disciples' feet. He came to them, taught them a lesson. Uh, on humility, taught him a lesson how that a servant 
uh, is, is not. He says the servant in verse 16 that the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. And he said in verse 17, if you do these things, happy are ye if you do them. And he says, I speak not to all of you. He begins to talk to them about the fact of his betrayal uh, that was coming up. He talks to them uh, in verse number 18. He said, I know who I have chosen. He says, but that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And he said, I tell it to you before it come, that when it come to pass you may believe that I'm He. He goes into further detail. If you go down in verses 21 and following, he goes into further detail uh, concerning his betrayal. If you look in verse uh, number 31 and following, he talks to him in verse 34 about, he said, a new commandment. Uh, that you love one another as I've loved you, uh, by, that you also should love one another. And he tells them in verse 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, you have love one for another. And you know the Bible teaches us that we're to love one another. We're to have a genuine, I'm not talking about uh, a put on love, I'm talking about a genuine love uh, one for another. I'm going to tell you if there's anybody uh, that you can't love, you need to get an altar and ask God to forgive you. The Bible tells us we're to love one another. We're to have that kind of love. And he said, by this, he says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples because you have this genuine love one for another. If you go on further in this chapter, you'll find where he talks about Peter's denial and how that Peter would deny him. And if you'll look at that, and you can see it in verses 36 through 38. If you'll go over in John chapter 18, you'll find where he, he, tell, he kind of uh, goes through this again concerning uh, Peter's denial. And it said there that, that in, in chapter number 18, it said in verse uh, 15, listen to this now, of what the Scripture said. And it said in verse... It says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That, uh, that disciple was known to the high priest and went to Jesus in the palace of the high priest, and Peter stood at the door. You know, Jesus had told him that he would deny him. And he said that Peter stood at the door without. And then that went out that other disciple, which was known to the high priest, spake to her that kept the door and brought in Peter. And the damsel that kept the door... Uh, uh, the damsel, then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art, thou, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He said, I'm not. And the servants and the officers stood there and had made a fire of coals, and it was cold. They warmed themselves. Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Skip down to verse 25. It says, As Peter stood and warmed himself, they said, Therefore to him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, uh, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? And Peter denied again. And it said, Then the cock crew. And so you've got Peter denying the Lord. If you go a little further, if you go to John chapter number 20, you'll find the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, verse number 19, it says the same evening... Uh, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, uh, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So all the disciples were gathered together. This was after the resurrection, and Jesus showed Himself to them. If you go down just a little further, you'll find that Thomas was not present. And the Bible tells us here in verse number 25 and 26, it says, Other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, uh, in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger in the print of the nails, thrust my hand to his side, I'll not believe. Said, After eight days again, uh, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. That's twice. After his resurrection, he showed himself. Peter was there. He was there in both instances. If you go to chapter number 21, 
You'll find in verse number 1, after these things, Jesus showed Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On this wise, He showed Himself. Skip down to verse number 7. It says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat, uh, for he was naked, did cast himself into the sea. And the Bible said, if you'll skip, Skip on down to verse 14. said, this is the third time that Jesus showed Himself to the disciples. So Peter was there all three times. The same Peter that denied the Lord. The same Peter that Jesus, Jesus had washed His feet. And Peter said, when Jesus came to him, Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter said, well, just not my feet, but just wash me all over. And a little later, Jesus would talk to him, how, talk to Peter about how he would deny him, that he even knew him. And Peter said, you know, I'll go with you. He said, I'll die with you. And Jesus told him, said, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny you even knew me. Before the cock crow, you're going to deny. And it all, it all came to pass exactly the way Jesus said. Now, can you imagine how Peter must have felt when he denied the Lord and the cock crow? And then it comes, it comes back to his heart and his mind exactly what Jesus told him he was going to do. Can you imagine how he must have felt? I mean, you're talking about wanting to crawl in a hole somewhere. That's probably exactly the way he felt. And then Jesus went to the cross. And he died. The very one that they had listened to and he had, he had taught them. And he died. And they saw him. He was taken down and... He was put in a barred tomb. He was placed there and it seemed so final. But then after His resurrection, we find where that Jesus three different times showed Himself to the disciples. And Peter was there all three times. And the latter part of verse number 21, look at something that, that happens here. It said that when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, this is verse 13, he said, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. In other words, he said, Peter, I got something for you to do. He said, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And it says, This he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. When he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Peter turns around and looks at John. And he asks Jesus, says, What about John? What's John going to do? What's going to happen with John? And Jesus in verse 22 saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? He says, Follow thou me. In other words, Peter, you've got something. You've got something you need to be doing, Peter. And you know, to look back on Peter's life, and a lot of times we criticize Peter because he was so outspoken. Sometimes he would talk and say something before he ever let his brain kind of get in gear. He was very outspoken. And we'll criticize Peter. People have criticized Peter because he got out of a boat and walked on water and then sunk. I'll tell you what, he did something that 11 other guys didn't do. He's done something I had never done. <laughs> I had never tried. But he walked on water. He, yes, he denied the Lord. But the Lord said, I've got something I want you to do. And so he had appeared to them, appeared to Peter. He'd washed their feet. After his resurrection, he made appearance, appearances to them. Gave them some instructions prior to his ascension. 
He told them that they were to tarry at Jerusalem until they be endued with power. He told them in Acts chapter number 1, just prior to them seeing a cloud receive Him out of their sight, He says, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter number 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And the Bible said that they spoke the Word of God with boldness. On the day of Pentecost, there was people from all different lands. And people talk about an unknown tongue. The only thing it's talking about is this. There was people from all different languages there. And when the disciples spoke, when they spoke, every person in those languages heard in their own language the wonderful works of God. That's what the Bible says happened. It was no gibberish. It was none of this stuff. God took the words. If they, it was like if there was a Chinaman came in this place today. And I don't know Chinese. I could not begin to speak Chinese. I mean, you've, I've, I've looked at it, and, and it's a bunch of scribbling. I can't, I can't make that out. They can't make out the English, probably. But it's just like if I got up here and began to preach, then God done the interpreting, and they could hear it in their own language. It was like I was speaking Chinese. That's what happened. Some of them said, these men are full of new wine. And Peter said this. Peter. He said, these men are not full of new wine. He said, this is what the prophet Joel said was going to happen and take place. This is fulfilling what the prophet Joel said would take place. Beginning in verse 14 of chapter 2 through verse 36, Peter preaches a message that you can read in just a few minutes. You know what the results were? There were 3,000 souls that were saved by God's grace. One man, one individual, empowered by the Holy Spirit, preaches a message, preaches the Word of God, the truth from God's Word. 3,000 souls, their lives are changed. They're never, ever the same again. If you go to Acts chapter number 3, you'll find that there's a lame man that's laid at the beautiful gate of the temple. And Peter and John were about to go into the temple at the hour of prayer. And the man sat there asking alms of those that went into the temple. And saw Peter and John about to go into the temple. And the Bible said that he asked an alms. And Peter said this. He said, silver and gold, how? he said, look on us. And the man looked, expecting to receive something. And Peter said this, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the Bible said immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people were filled with wonder and amazement. And they ran upon Peter and John as if they had done this great deed. And Peter said, why are you looking on us? As by our own power that we've done this. He it says, it's through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man is standing here before you whole. Now, I've said all of that to say this. Opposition arose as a result of what took place and what was happening. Opposition arose. If you look in Acts chapter number 4, and you look in the first three verses, 
It says that they spake to the people, as they spake to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tied. But you know what? They will steal some results. The next verse says, How be it? Notice that first word. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. 5,000. Now what was the difference in Peter? The difference in Peter was what took place on Pente- at Pentecost. That was what the difference was in Peter. He was the same Peter that had denied the Lord. He's the same Peter that said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. He's the same Peter that when the cock crew went out and wept bitterly, he's the same Peter that after the resurrection had saw the Lord. He had visibly seen the resurrected Lord. That was the same Peter. He was the same Peter that said in in John chapter 21, he said, I go a fishing. And he went fishing. But Jesus showed himself again and called on Peter and said, Peter, I got something for you to do. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Follow me. That's what I've got for you to do. Peter. Peter. The opposition came. Results still came about. 5,000 men or 5,000 men were saved by God's wonderful grace. In verse 5 through 7 of chapter 4 said, It came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as there many were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered, gathered Jerusalem and when they had set them in the midst they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? They ask a question. What power or what name have you done this? All the council got together and they ask a question. Now I want to ask you a question. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe this? Here Peter was. He was no different than you and I. Peter had made a lot of mistakes in his life. Peter had no doubt had disappointed the Lord, just like you and I have many times in our life. But you know what? The Lord didn't stop with Peter. He didn't say, Peter, you're not worth anything. Peter, you denied me. Peter, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to tell you this. God's got something for every single one of us to do. And do we really believe this? Do we really believe this? I want you to notice very briefly what happens now beginning in verse number 8. It says, Then Peter, remember the denier, remember the one that had so many questions, remember the one that went out and wept bitterly. It says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 18, it says, Be ye not drunk with wine where in is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. That is a command for the word, from the Word of God for every child of God. And it says to be filled with the Spirit. How, how are you filled? How can you be filled with the Spirit of God? Number one is get on your knees. It's going to take some cleansing. It's going to take some cleansing. If we're to be what God wants us to be as an individual or as a church, it's going to first take some cleansing. It's going to spend, we're going to have to spend some time on our knees and on our face before God, calling out to Him and asking Him to forgive us of sin and asking Him to cleanse us. We can't clean up ourselves. 
the very best that you and I can do is nothing but filthy rags. We can't turn over a new leaf. I'm going to tell you what, every time you turn over a new leaf, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do better. You know what's going to happen? Every time we try to do better, we fail because we're doing it in our own strength. But number one, number one, if we're to be Spirit-filled, we've got to be a clean vessel. We've got to be cleansed. And it's going to take some time on our knees and our face before God. I'm not talking about one of these little two-minute prayers. I'm talking about being in agony. And I'm going to get into that a little, a little later on at another date. Get into agony before God concerning our condition not talking about that person sitting next to us. Not talking about the person behind us and how sorry they are. Not talking about that person that lives next door to us. I'm talking about us as an individual. Bobby talked this morning uh, looking in a mirror and looking in a mirror and actually seeing ourselves. And we see ourselves and we begin, if we'll look in the light of the Word of God, we'll begin to see ourselves as God sees us. Read Isaiah chapter number 6. And you'll see Isaiah, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. The very next thing Isaiah saw, he saw himself as he was. He said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And he had to allow God, God brought the cleansing to him. As the seraphim went got the, uh, with the tongs and got, got a coal from the altar and brought it and touched Isaiah's lips. And the very next thing Isaiah says, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw himself as he ought to see himself. And then he allowed God to cleanse him. And the very next thing that Isaiah said, God said, who am I going to send and who's going to go for us? And Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'm ready. None of us are ready to do God's work until there's a cleansing that takes place. I sin every day. You sin every day. But I thank God for 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. If we'll confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so it's going to take that time on our knees and on our face, agonizing before God and allowing God to clean us up. And something else, you hold in your lap a great key for you as a child of God. To be Spirit-filled, we've got to be a clean vessel in touch with God. Get in the Word of God. Get in God's Word. Saturate yourself with the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We need God's Word. We need God's Word in our life. We need God's Word in our heart. We need God's Word every single day of our life. It's that spiritual nourishment that you and I need to grow and mature in our walk with God. How in the world are we going to know what we need to do unless we get in God's Word? I've had people to tell me, say, Preacher, if I don't read it, I'm not accountable for it. I'm going to tell you what, that's straight out of hell this morning. His word is forever settled in heaven. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Ask God, ask God to show you. Confess sin. Be a clean vessel before Him. Get in the Word of God. Saturate yourselves with the things of God. Spiritual nourishment. Spiritual food. If we're going to be a spiritual individual, if we're going to be Spirit-filled, we've got to get in God's Word. And not only read it, but do it. Be obedient to God's Word. Do what God's Word says. I know what His Word says, but God understands I'm just flesh. I mean, I, I've heard all of that kind of stuff. I've said a lot of it myself. You know, God knows I'm weak. God knows what kind of individual I am. God knows. Yes, He does. He knows. That's why He sent His Son. That's why the blood was shed on Calvary. Because He knows who you and I are. And He knows exactly what we need. The Scripture says, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, 
talking to the rulers, talking to the council. He said, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He said, if we this day be examined of the good deed to the, done to the impotent man. Notice what Peter said, to the good deed. This religious bunch, they, were, they wasn't looking at a changed life. They hated Jesus. They hated Peter and John. <laughs> These religious leaders did. You know what Jesus said? He said, don't, don't be surprised. And I'm paraphrasing this. He said, don't be surprised that the world hate, hates you because they hated me as well. I'm going to tell you what. Christians are a minority in this nation. Who is made more fun of? I mean, Christians. You take a stand on your faith, and boy, there's, there's people going to... They're going, to, they're going to say you're discriminatory, you're a bigot. They're going to have all kinds of... You stand on the Word of God. You know, we've got our rights. You can't say nothing about us. We've got our rights. I'm going to tell you what, God's Word still says what it says, and it means what it says, and it's not going to change. It's not going to change. And here they... <laughs> He said, if we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, notice this. He says, by what means he is made whole? He says, be it known unto you. Huh? Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel. Be it known to everybody. He says, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. You crucified Him, but you know what? Death couldn't hold Him. You crucified Him. The grave had no victory over Him. It says, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him... Doth this man stand here before you whole? It's because of Jesus. It's because of the name of Jesus. It's because of the blood of Jesus. It's because of Him that this man's life has been changed. And I'm going to tell you what, if you're here this morning saved by the grace of God, it's because of Him that your life's been changed. It's not because of some preacher it's not because of some singing group. It's not because of them that your life's been changed. It's because of the power of God. It's because of Jesus Christ that your life's been changed. And if this world, if there's any hope at all uh, for this world, it's in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. That's all it is. Peter told him, said, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. That's from Psalms 118.22. The last verse is this. And I want you to notice what this says. In verse 12. And you get a hold of this verse. Do we really believe this? Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You know what Peter tells them right here? He tells them the way. He says, neither is there salvation in any other. I know we live in a culture today that says it don't matter what you believe. Believe what you want to. We're all trying to get the same place. That's, that's the culture that we leave, live in today. But I'm going to tell you what, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says, God's Word says, neither is there salvation in any other. He's telling us that Jesus is the only way. If you're planning on going to heaven, if you're mom, dad, brother, sister, son, or daughter, if they're planning on going to heaven, if that aunt or uncle, if that grandparent, if that next door neighbor, 
If that co-worker, if they're planning on going to heaven, the Bible tells us neither is there salvation in any other. He's the only way. He alone is the only way. He was the only means that that impotent man was standing before those rulers whole. And Peter said, it's through Jesus and it's through His name that this man is standing before you whole. And I'm going to tell you what, if you're saved by the grace of God this morning, it's through Jesus and through Him alone that you stand as whole before a holy and a mighty God. He's the only way that we can stand before God is through His Son Jesus. It's the only way. He said, neither. He said, this is the way. Neither is there salvation in any other. He says, for there is none other name under heaven given. I like that word, don't you? It says given among men. You know what that talks to me about? That talks to me about grace. Grace. Given. Given. Aren't you glad you didn't have to go earn salvation? (laughs) You know? Or had to drop enough, drop enough in the offering plate to get saved. Or maybe give enough for somebody to pray you out of purgatory. I'm glad it's not that way. It's by grace. I don't deserve, I don't deserve being saved. I do not deserve being saved. I do not deserve being a child of God. Do not deserve the fact that just like they sung about, you know, it's still the blood. I don't deserve one drop of that blood being shed. Not one single drop. None of us do. It's by grace. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to earn it. You know, people will say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not sure, I'm just not, not sure if I did this. I'm not sure if I did that, or I'm not sure if I did this. I'm going to tell you what, if you did anything other than just simply putting your faith in Him. You know, it's not good deeds. Those cults that are coming around knocking on your doors, you know what they're doing? They're trying to earn their way. It don't matter how many doors they knock on. It don't matter how many pieces of their paper that they pass out. It don't matter. That ain't going to do it. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given. God gave. That's grace. Grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The last part of that verse says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's imperative. It's imperative that a person is saved. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, what did He tell him? He said, you must be born again. You must be. He didn't say you ought to be. He didn't say you should be. He said, you must be born again. I want to ask you the question one more time. Do we really believe this? Church, Do we really believe this? That Jesus is the only way? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that it's by grace we're saved through faith? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that a person must be saved in order to go to heaven? Do we really? and truly believe that. Do we? Do we? Do we really and truly believe it?
walked out of your home and got in an automobile and got killed in an auto accident. Do we really believe that if they died without Christ that they were going to hell? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that that person that we've had a job next to for 40 years that don't know Christ as Savior, that if they died in that shape, that they were going to hell. Do we really believe that? Do we? Do we really believe that if that, that, if that husband or wife that's not saved died in that shape, that they were going to hell? Do we really believe that? Do we? What about that classmate? Well, your best friends, and they're not saved. And if they died in that shape, do we really believe they'd go to hell? If we really believed it, I'm going to tell you this, if we really and truly believed it, we couldn't sit on a pew idle if we really believed it. If we really believed it, we wouldn't want one single person to go to this place called hell. If we really believed it. You know, our, our country is on a roller coaster ride to hell. <laughs> our country as a whole if we really believe that book like we say we do, what kind of difference would that make in our lives? You say, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not an officer of the church. Are you a child of God? What kind of difference? will it make in our lives if we really believe what we say we believe? Do we believe it? Do we believe that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved? Do we believe that verse? I'm going to tell you what. P Peter, with boldness, preached that message. He was not popular. He was not well thought of in the religious circles. We're being taught today, don't offend somebody because of their religion. You better tell them about salvation because religion will send them to hell. Let's stand our feet, we will.